from Fargo since it's so far north. But we're delighted to have him up from the south, as it were, and uh, grateful for the message this morning. So, brother, why don't you come and give us the message this tonight? Thank you. Appreciate it. Praise the Lord. I've changed a little bit in my views of what is north. And what I was in Oklahoma last week preaching, and I told them when I was a boy gr- growing up as a young man, I thought anybody north of the Red River was a Yankee. <laughs> but that's not quite the truth. <laughs> but anyway, we're going to be in Matthew chapter 20. It's good to be back this evening. I appreciate your church. I appreciate the Wartners very much and I appreciate what the Lord is doing here and uh, it's a blessing this is what we need all around our country and all around the world is sound churches who stand for the Word of God and and uh, believe in missions and so it's a it's been a delight really to be here and um, you you may not be able to see it from where you are but I'm sporting a band-aid right here and I feel like I need to tell you what happened. <laughs> it, I had a senior moment today. Um, there at the motel, uh, by the motel, there's this uh, kind of an event center where they have this whirly ball. I don't know if y'all even know what whirly ball is. It sounds kind, of, sounds kind of squirrely, really. But anyway, so I was walking over there. I'm going to go check it out. And it's really a deal where they try, it's a game, and they use bumper cars to do it. Little kids were in there doing it. But going down there, I kept looking for the hallway to take to a left to go over there because I knew I had to go to the left to get to that building over there from our hotel. It was, you had, there's an entrance from our hotel. So I started down this hall and I thought it was it and then I stopped and I hesitated, really I, it wasn't it. So I turned to go back down the hallway and when I did, I kind of did a face plant into a, a glass wall, really. It wasn't a door, it was a wall. And um, yeah, you should feel sorry for me. I would appreciate that. <laughs> So, my, my grandfather would say, I s- bled like a stuck pig. <laughs> but, anyway, and, my, and I, you know, that's what happens when my wife is not with me. <laughs> and it's not that she could have prevented it from happening, but at least I could have blamed her for it happening. <laughs> but now it's just me, right? So, and, and by the way, she doesn't know anything about this yet. It's a, I'll try to, she'll find out soon enough. I appreciate the emphasis this morning and throughout the day really on praying for our country. We're, we really need to be doing that. And, and uh, you know, I know, it's, I know that God can do anything, and He sets up nations and tears down nations. And God can do anything. The King's heart is in the hand of the Lord. But, but like this morning's message, He wants to use us. We have a part. We have a role. And so, Lord willing, next week... Uh, My wife and I will be going and voting absentee. My philosophy is vote early and vote often, right? (laughs) It's crazy, isn't it? We're going to talk about missions tonight. Matthew chapter 20. Um, Matthew chapter 20. And I want to begin in verse 1 and read the context And then um, we'll actually look back in a little bit at chapter 19 as well. But Matthew chapter 20 and verse 1 begins with these words. For the kingdom of heaven is like unto a man that is a householder. That would be like a landowner. Someone who is a, you know, own the property, responsible for the property. The kingdom of heaven is like unto a man that is a householder which went out early in the morning to hire laborers into his vineyard. It's important to remember as we go through this, this is what the kingdom of heaven is like. Verse 2, And when he had agreed with the laborers, like there was some negotiating going on, when he had agreed with the laborers for a penny a day, he sent them into his, his vineyard. A penny a day doesn't sound like much, but a it was, it was the going rate. It was like the equivalent of a day's wages, really a pence, a penny. Verse 3, so he sends them into his vineyard, verse 2, and then verse 3 he says, And he went, talking about this householder, he went out about the third hour. Now, uh, generally speaking, if you were to Google, you know, what is the, 
Jewish calendar, they would tell you that the, the er, er, first hour of the day would be about 6 a.m., typically. And then the third hour of the day would be around 9 in the morning. So he goes out the third hour and saw others standing idle in the marketplace. They're just standing around. And said unto them, Go ye also into the vineyard, and whatsoever is right, I will give you. And they went their way. And verse 5 says, And again, or again he went out about the sixth and ninth hour, around noon, around 3 p.m., and did likewise. In other words, he said to them, Go into the vineyard, I'll pay you whatever's right. Verse 6, And about the eleventh hour, now we're talking about eve, the end of the day, 5 p.m., just to, probably more uh, the days about spent. About the eleventh hour, he went out and found others. He's still recruiting, even at the even at the late in the day. He found others standing idle, and saith unto them, Why stand ye here all the day idle? They'd been they hadn't just been there idle for a while. He says, Why are you still out here idle? They say unto him, This was their response. They say unto him, Because no man hath hired us. He saith unto them, Go ye also into the vineyard, and whatsoever is right, that shall you receive. So when even was come, when the day is spent, the Lord of the vineyard saith unto his steward, that would be like a supervisor, a foreman, a, ma a manager, he saith unto his steward, Call the laborers, and give them their hire, pay them for their day's work. Beginning from the last, start with the last one that was hired unto the first. And when they came that were hired about the eleventh hour, about five in the evening, they received every man a penny. But when the first came, the first ones that were hired, they supposed, they assumed that they should have received more. And they likewise received every man a penny. And when they had received it, they murmured against the goodman of the house. They criticized the owner, saying... These last, these last people that got in at the last moment, these last have wrought but one hour. And thou hast made them equal unto us, have, which have borne the burden and heat of the day. This is not fair. This is not right. This was not in our contract. Verse 13, But he answered one of them and said, Friend, I do thee no wrong. Didst not thou agree with me for a penny? This is what you agreed to, right? By the way, this wouldn't fly in most places we work, right? <laughs> take that thine is, and take your pay, and go thy way. I will give unto this last, even as unto thee. Verse 15, is it not lawful for me to do, that, to do what I will with mine own? Is thine eye evil because I'm good? So the last shall be first, and the first last, for many be called but few chosen. Now we're going to look at this passage in light of serving the Lord uh, tonight. And I just really want to have prayer in a moment. But look in verse 6 at the question at the end of verse 6. And that's, that's really the probing question for me tonight. Why stand you here all the day idle? Let's pray. Father, we thank you again for your word. And we thank you for the privilege we have to stand here tonight. And Lord, to be a part of what you're doing in the Metropolitan Baptist Church, Lord, we rejoice and we rejoice in the truth. We rejoice in your work and we need you, Lord, tonight. We need your help. We need your strength. We need your wisdom. We ask you to bless. Help us to glean from this passage what you have for us. And God, would you, would you just keep the devil from stealing the good seed of the word of God? lest it bear fruit in our lives. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I want to go back to the beginning of this chapter and just take a few moments and introduce it. Um, you'll notice the word for, the first word of verse 1, chapter 20, verse 1, for. It's an interesting way to start a sentence, isn't it? For, which tells us what? That it kind of ties into what's being said. It's already been said. The, and so... To really just quickly look at this, look with me if you would in chapter 19 and beginning in verse 16, and I'm not going to read all this for time's sake, but verse 16 says, And behold, one came and, and said unto him, said unto Jesus, Good master, what good things shall I do that I may have eternal life? The man wanted to know how to be saved, and Jesus gives him his, 
Really, his normal uh, response is he presents the law to him in verse 18. The, what does the law say in verse 19? In verse 20, the young man says, I've, I've kept this perfectly, which is not true, obviously. Verse 21, Jesus said, If thou wilt be perfect, go and sell that thou hast, and give to the poor, and thou shalt have treasure in heaven, and come and follow me. But when the young man heard that saying, he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. He, he really wasn't willing to let Jesus have his way in his life. But notice verse 23 says, Then said Jesus. So what, he, what just happened now ties into this. As soon as that was said, as soon as that conversation took place, Then said Jesus to his disciples, Verily I say unto you that a rich man shall hardly enter into the kingdom of heaven. It's easier in verse 24 for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. Verse 25, when his disciples heard it, they were exceedingly amazed, saying, Who then can be saved? Jesus beheld them and said, With men this is impossible, but with God all things are possible. And it is impossible for people to be saved without Him, but with God anybody can be saved. Then, verse 27, so... They just keep talking, answering questions and dialogue in here. Verse 27, Then answered Peter and said unto him, Behold, we've forsaken all and followed thee. Keep in mind, this all started with the man that Jesus said, You need to sell what you have and follow me. And he wasn't willing to do that. So Peter, the conversation, the context continues. And Peter says, Lord, we've, we've forsaken everything and followed you. What shall we have therefore? And Jesus said, for you, in verse 28, talking about the twelve, you'll sit on the throne, uh, on twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. But 29 says, and everyone, this is not just the twelve, everyone that's forsaken houses or brethren or sisters or brother or father or mother or wife or children or lands for my name's sake shall receive a hundredfold and shall inherit everlasting life. But many that are first shall be last and the last shall be first. We tend to think that those that are first will be first, and those that are last shall be last, but it's not always that way. So all this is said about, you know, what it takes to follow the Lord, and people who are not willing to follow the Lord, and Peter says, well, what about us? And he says, you know, you're going to be, you're going to be rewarded this, in this life and in eternity. And then in verse 20, or verse 1 of chapter 24, and so this teaching, this parable has to do with this context. I hope you can see that. We took a few minutes to explain that. And so, so Jesus is going to give us in this passage what the kingdom of heaven is like. I'm not saying, it's not my opinion of what the kingdom of heaven is like. It's what Jesus said. This is what the kingdom of heaven is like in verse 1. It's like this man that had this, he was a householder, he was a wealthy man, and he, he went out early in the morning to hire laborers into his vineyard. That would be equivalent of someone going to the employment agency now, looking for a job. Now you, most of you maybe have never experienced this, but I can remember as a kid when my grandfather, who was a rancher and a farmer and took care of land and crops and things, uh, he was not a wealthy person, but he knew he made a living of it. That's really what he did. And, but I can remember him going into town to look for people standing around that he might be able to hire them to do some chore that he had. This is, this is the way it worked. It may seem strange to many of us, but that's exactly what was happening. And so Jesus said, this is what it, the kingdom of heaven is like. Now, what, the, what, is we, what are we going to learn in this passage? We're going to learn some things how that people answered the call at different times. Some came at the first call, some the second call, some the third call, some the last call. And so it's about people who answered the call at different stages or times. And I think there's some valuable lessons here. So here we go. Several things that I'd like to mention and I'll try to be, I'll try to be quick. I never have succeeded, but I've tried many times. <laughs> Here's the first thing that I see. The, keep, keep the question in mind. Why stand ye here all the day idle? Now that, that is a man who is hiring people to go into the field, the vineyard to work, to labor, but it's a picture of the kingdom of heaven, right? And so the first thing I would say is there's still many who are idle. Why stand, there's still people that are idle. They're not, they're not engaged in the Lord's work. And I think we would agree that in most churches, this church included, many churches, there are a lot of people involved. Whether it's helping in a Sunday school class or doing outreach or going on mission trips or certainly involved in 
a faith promise and trying to get the gospel out to as many people as possible. But for, for all of us, it's good to be reminded that there's still many that probably are idle, that they're still in that holding pattern. And by the way, this, this is not talking about attending church. This is talking about serving the Lord. I I'm, thank God for people that come to church, right? They hear the word of God. They're being edified. The sheep are being fed. But these, this is about laboring in God's vineyard. That's what this is about. It's about laboring in some form of ministry. That could be, that could be just going personal witnessing. That could be going on church outreach. That could be, you know, whatever the case may be. It may be visiting nursing homes. I, I have such a high regard for nursing home ministry. I'm not sure if the church here is involved in that. Our church today was in four nursing homes. And... Just singing and ministering and encouraging and loving and, and giving the gospel to them. Or maybe just, you know, maybe involved in hospital ministry. But of course it would talk about missions. Those who are laboring to get the gospel out. Laboring in God's vineyard. And a part of that, especially as it pertains, as you know, to missions... Is, is, is tithing, but also faith promise giving, grace giving, giving, giving above our tithes and offerings for the cause of missions. And every part of that con contribution, whether it's praying, encouraging. I was talking to a missionary within the last week who's back home and um, he's uh, actually taking a staff position in a church. He's he, I can't remember all the numbers. He was, I think, 15 years in Russia and then several more years. And I'm not remembering the country right now. But I asked him this question. I said, how many people ever came to the mission field to visit you while you were there? And in all those years, he had one person come to see him. Now, he, he's not over there. He wasn't over there. Uh, for people to come to see him. But I'm just saying, a visit to somebody like that to encourage them, you know, to be a part of what they're doing. I'm just saying, all of us ought to have a part. And you say, well, my part's not that large. Well, every contribution matters. And the point is, the Lord is still looking to hire workers for his vineyard, no matter what time it is. It's, I'm going to tell you, for most of it's not the six o'clock hour. And it's not the, I don't know what hour it is, but I'm telling you, it's later than it's ever been. And so, but the good news is, he's still hiring people. Amen. He's still employing people. He's still putting people to work, no matter what hour it is. And so, it's that way in the kingdom of heaven. And so the question is, why stand you here idle? The Lord, I, I take from this, and in many other places, that the Lord wants all of us involved. Would you agree with that? The Lord wants all of us involved. And, the, and part of the missions conference, to me, the missions month, is, is saying, Lord, how, what is my role? What is my part? And you probably have heard that Sunday after Sunday after Sunday, and you're going to hear it next Sunday. We ought to be asking God, what is my part? What is the church's part as a whole, but what is my part? You know, there, there, could, there could be people in our church, there probably are people in our church, who want us to do more for missions, want our church to have a bigger uh, footprint in world missions, who may not be doing anything themselves. Don't you think that's a possibility? So God wants all of us to be involved. There's still too many that are idle. So that's the first, that's the first point. There's still too many that are idle. The second point I get from this text, and all, every, every one of these things I'm going to take right from our text he wants us active, and the earlier the better. The earlier the better. I mean, some were ready to serve early in the morning. That's about 6 a.m. By the way, in the, in the world of agriculture, you know, you start when the, day, when the sun comes up. And I know a lot of, some young people don't even realize the sun comes up gradually. But, <laughs> <laughs> but it does. <laughs> I don't know it. My wife told me about it. No, but anyway. <laughs> but so, so he wants us. Here's the point. This is about the kingdom of heaven. And, and I can only draw this conclusion from this text. He wants us active as soon as possible. He, he, he preferred that they answer the six o'clock call, but some didn't answer until the nine o'clock call. Others came at the noon hour. Some came at 3 p.m. Some came even at 5 p.m. 
Now, what do these times mean? I'm not 100% sure. I think they could be times having to do with the number of our years, how many years we've been alive. But it could also be the, the length of time since we got saved. For instance, when I got saved, I was 21. And so that was, if I got started right then, which by His grace I did, then I started about the 6 o'clock hour. It wasn't the 6 o'clock hour of my physical life, but it was the 6 a.m. of my spiritual life. Does that make sense to you? And so we don't know exactly what it means. It could mean both. But I know this, the earlier the person starts, the better it is. The earlier you start, the more you have to offer. The more time you have to offer. The more opportunities you have before you. The more energy you have. I can't say that from experience, but I've heard people say that. They, the, so the better, the sooner the better, really. So we ought to make ourselves available early in life. You know, Pastor and I were just talking tonight about how people get integrated into the church and serve in the church. And, and I was just kind of sharing with him. But, you know, when a person comes into our church, either by baptism or moves their membership, change their membership, there's some things they can get involved in right away. Uh, we have volunteers who clean. Uh, most of our building are cleaned by volunteers. They could be on a cleaning team. They could, they could work in the nursery, things of that nature, after they've been vetted, all those kind of things. Um, they could go on visitation, things like that. But there may be other things they might have to wait. But I'm just saying this. Get involved soon. Get involved in ministry as soon as you can. And be willing to serve. Be willing, like I said, you know, it would be wonderful to uh, just say, well, I'm going to go visit the nursing home and just go. We have people who sometimes at our church just go door to door in the nursing home just to talk to whoever answers the door and, and comfort them and share with them. It's just We can all get involved in the ministry. And it seems to me in looking at this text, just looking at this man, this landowner, this, it seems to me that he was, I don't know that he was surprised necessarily, but he was disturbed that these people are still standing around doing nothing. Can you get, do you see that? Why are you standing here idle? There's work, there's work to be done. There's, there's an opportunity to work. And so I just want to encourage you tonight, and I know this is not for everybody, but maybe you didn't respond to the early call, but don't waste this time of your life. Whatever time it is for you, get involved in the Lord's work. I'm glad I started as a 21-year-old. I say a kid, I was an adult, but I, I, it was so long ago. But, you know, I regret that I didn't start sooner. I regret that I wasn't in church as a kid and start serving the Lord as a teenager. And so, so and even as a matter of faith promise, maybe you haven't really got into it yet. Maybe you've thought about it, you've prayed about it, you've heard about it, and you've never really joined with us on that. But now would be a great time. Do it now. Say, I'm going to start. I'm going to pray about it. What does God want me to do? You know, we first started... Supporting missions by faith promise in our church in 1992. I'd already been the pastor there for 10, 11 years. And, uh, but we just really came around to believing that this is God's plan. It's the pattern of the New Testament. And so I, I'm thankful for 32 years. My wife and I have been able to support that. We, you know, but uh, we, didn't, we didn't do it prior to then. But I'm just saying some people here have probably been supporting missions longer than that. And thank God for that. And uh, so, as a, so start, start serving. Young person, start serving the Lord. You don't have to be an old man or an old woman to start serving the Lord. Cons and we talked about this today. Consider going to a mission field. I know some of you have. One of the young men was telling me about uh, one of the ladies and a teenager that was uh, on a mission trip last year, I guess it was, or year before last, that's, that some of y'all were on. And, and we just had a, my grandson went uh, just uh, last year to Ecuador with somebody else in the church. We just had another guy just got back from uh, Africa, a 15-year-old or so. I'm just saying, there's, there's something, it's valuable just to get involved and, and hands-on, get, you know, realize what it's like to be in mission. So he wants us active. The earlier, the better. We have this tendency sometimes to procrastinate, to put things off, to drag our feet. And for some things, that's not so bad, but in serving God, He's saying, why stand you here idle? Why are you standing around? So, so number one, there's still too many are idle, idle. Number two, he wants us active early. Number three, and I'm just going to mention this because it's not that important, but it is in the text, and that is this. When you, whatever time you start, including me, you might look at me and say, man, you got in early. Not really. When I got in, a lot of people have been in before me. And so here's the third thing. Others have been serving before you. 
And I say that because sometimes we get intimidated by the fact, you know, that I can never catch up. They're so far ahead, I can never catch up. No, we need other people to encourage us. And by the way, we encourage other people. And so it, it encourages me when I see young people serving the Lord. What a blessing that is. So number three, others have been serving before you. Number four, and I don't like this one, but it's in there, so I'm going to say it. Some, some may need to be asked. We see that in this text, right? You know, I wish it wasn't like that. Because I'd like for everybody just to respond without necessarily being invited to or asked to. But we see it in this text. You know, he goes, he's asking people. Now, who does, this, who does this landowner, who does he represent? He represents the Lord. And what's the Lord doing? He's asking people. He keeps asking people. So if you think, if you think you're being, being asked a lot, you know, in this missions month, he, he was asking people. He'd get people to work, go back and get some more. Get people to work, go back and get some more. Get people to work. That's what we're to learn from this passage. And so, um, sometimes people need to be asked. The first, the first personal experience I had, hands-on ministry, was when a man in our church who was like a staff member who was in charge of outreach, it was the church we were saved in, came up to me as a nighttime service, much like this. I was over on this side of the auditorium. He came up to me. I was standing. He was like behind the chair, chairs or pew, and I was in front of it. And he said, I'd like for you to pray about something. He was a pretty persuasive individual. He didn't really want me to pray about it. He just wanted to get me. <laughs> no, he did. I'd like to pray about something. I said, what is it? By the way, it's the same man that asked me to pray about moving to Missouri in 1977. But this was 1975. And he said, I'd like, for, I'd like for you to consider getting involved in the bus outreach. And I said, you know, I think I'd, I'd like to do that. And, and I don't know, it was a week or two. It was right, right away I, I got involved. And man, I'm telling you, I was, I'm a hook, I was hooked. I mean, I was immediately hooked. Now, I'm a, you wouldn't know this, but I'm a very introverted passive kind of a personality and uh, I had to get I have to get out of my comfort zone a lot for me to go up to a stranger's door and say I want your kids I mean <laughs> I had to get I had to really get worked up to do that but I'll tell you when I started seeing young people and adults climb on that bus and go to church and hear the gospel I'm telling you I was hooked and you know how it all started someone asked me why don't you do this? I went up to a man in our church just a, maybe a month ago. I lose track of time. Maybe a month ago. He'd been, he's been a member of our church, him and his wife and daughter. They've been in members of our church for less than a year, a matter of months. Um, and I had gone to a few nursing home services recently when I've been home. Those four nursing home services are not my responsibility. But sometimes when I'm home, they'll say, would you like to go preach in the nursing home? And I do that occasionally. So it's been on my heart. So I said to him, I said, you know, I'd like for you to pray about thinking something. He said, what is it? I'd like for you to pray about getting involved in the nursing home ministry. And, and I had to leave town right after that. And I was gone for a couple of weeks, but I heard he'd been going. So I asked him next time I was at church, I said, hey, RJ, that's his initial. RJ, I heard you've been going to the nursing home. He said, man, that's been so good. You know, sometimes people need to be asked. You know, he, and I'm not saying that we're, that's not trying to, that's not trying to manipulate people. That's not trying to coerce people. This is trying to help people get involved. He's going, Jesus is asking all of us to serve Him. And the Bible's full of examples of that. And that's what we get here. Why stand you here all the day idle? If I were to say that to somebody, why do you keep standing around when you ought to be serving God? They could get offended. That's not me saying it, though. Jesus is the one that's saying it. By the way, we ought to take it seriously when someone asks us to serve. Jesus recruited these workers throughout the scriptures, right? He recruited, you know, Andrew and Peter and James and John, Levi, Matthew, the tax collector. He re re recruited these people. He was asking people, now please hear me. During meetings like this, God is often compelling people. To get involved in his work. You say, well, by the way, it's, it's, it's not me, not my words, not Pastor Wartner's words that, it, that, that ought to be the determining factor. But God uses 
God uses invitations like this for people to say, hey, maybe that's something I should do. Maybe I ought to get involved in some area of the... This is what the kingdom of heaven is like. Some may, may need to be asked. Number five. Here's, I get this from the text. It's never been this late before. You know, the day is far spent. Jesus said, work while it's day, for the night cometh when no man can work. Right? Right? Jesus told His disciples, you know, don't say there's four months and then come with the harvest. Right. Look out on the fields, they're right, right already into harvest. That's pretty direct language, isn't it? You know why? You know why? Because He's the one who's recru- recruiting people for the work. And he's, so delaying, delaying could mean losing the crop. And, uh, you know, you're, if, you, if you're here tonight and you're not in some form or fashion involved in gospel ministry, reaching people with the gospel, making disciples. If you're not personally involved, you may say, well, my kids are involved, my wife's involved, my husband's involved, but I'm not really involved. I just want to urge you to realize I'm not the one that's asking. Jesus is, the recruiting station is open, right? Equal opportunity employment. (laughs) He's recruiting people. He's asking people. Would you get involved? Would you have, where, where can we put you in? Where, where could you work? And this, you know, who knows? One of these days, this, the day is going to be over, the day for serving. Work while it is day for the night cometh when no man can work. So our remaining time to serve, it's only going to get shorter and shorter. And I'll make you a promise. That if you'll get in doing what God wants you to do with the right heart attitude, you'll never regret it. You'll never regret it. Nobody's going to be standing in heaven, standing before the judgment seat of the judgment seat of Christ, who's worked a lot and served the Lord a lot. Nobody's going to stand there and say, "Man, why did I spend so much time serving the Lord?" <laughs> Not going to happen, right? So it's never been this late before. Number six, it's not too late to get started. I mean, these people, some of, them been, some of them obviously had been there a while. Why stand ye here idle all the day long? They'd been there for a while. And, and yet he said, come on, i got a place for you. Come on, I've got a place for you. So maybe there's somebody here and you're thinking, man, I've, I've just squandered some time. I'm just going to tell you, it's not too late to get back in it. It's not too late to get started. Maybe you've gotten out of the habit of visiting. Maybe you got out of the habit of serving. Maybe you haven't been giving to missions. Maybe you haven't been supporting in your missions program. This, This is a picture of a landowner. This is what I see. A landowner with an inexhaustible supply of opportunities to work. Right? Man, I'm going to sign up right now. Oh, I already did. You know, it's the devil that lies to people and says, you know, it's too late. You might as well not even do it. It's too late. It's never too late to start doing what's right. So do what we can now. So number six, that was number six. It's not too late to get started. Number seven. It's in the text, what I'm about to say. Those who are serving should never quit. The one that started at 6 o'clock was still out there when he caught... Brought, he's out there at 6 working while he's working. People at 9 o'clock, are come, more people are coming. 10, 12 o'clock, more people are coming. 3 o'clock, more people are coming. 5 o'clock, more people are coming. And the 6 o'clock guy is still there. I, I can't get anything else from this but that. Those who are serving should never quit serving. Right? Amen. You know, as a pastor, uh, confess your faults one to another, James says, pray one for another. As a pastor, it's difficult for me to see people who are not willing to serve, I have to tell you. And I don't take it personally, I don't take it like they're rejecting me. I'm just thinking, Jesus has done so much for us. Why wouldn't we find something to do for Him? You know what I'm saying? just makes sense to me but there's something that's equally troubling to me and that's for somebody who once served 
who no longer serves. You know, there's no... I, I'll, I'll acknowledge that um, there may be some things that I can't do as much as I once did, or there may be some things that I can't do that I once did, but I'm going to do, by the grace of God, I'm going to do what I can. Amen? I've, heard, I've actually heard people say this. Usually, I think it's usually about working in the nursery. <laughs> but this is what they say. I've done my time. Let the younger people take it. And if I worked in the nursery, I'd probably say that too. <laughs> but, the, but really, we should never quit. We quit, should never quit serving the Lord. I tell you, I thank God for people that I've known for many, many years. There are people in our church that as long as I can remember, they have been working in children's ministries, like on Sunday morning in children's ministry. 25 years, 30 years. And, you know, and, I, and I, they have two things going for them. Number one, they love serving the Lord. Number two, they don't like listening to me preach. So <laughs> it's a win-win for them. <laughs> So, so those who are serving should never quit. And if you have, if you say, well, I've kind of, I've kind of taken a sabbatical or something, well, get back in. I was thinking about John Mark. You know, John Mark was on that first missionary journey. And on that first missionary journey, he, he bailed. We don't know why. We don't know exactly why. I think there was something about the difficulty of the journey. I think something about the trials of it. Something he didn't understand when he signed up or whatever it was. But he quit. But you know what? You know this. When Paul wrote to his second epistle to Timothy, he said, bring John Mark. He's profitable unto me in the ministry. John Mark had gotten back in the ministry. And you know, we know how, we know how important he was, because just after this gospel, the gospel of Matthew, you have the gospel of Mark. God used him to give us one of the gospels. I'm just telling you, here's a guy who got out, who got back in. You can, right? He's still asking you. He's still calling people. Don't, don't, ever, don't ever quit. And if you quit, get back in. The last thing I want to say about this text, and this is the part that my church likes the most, because they always like the last point the most. <laughs> Number eight, we will all be properly rewarded. It's in the text. We will all be properly rewarded. Notice what he said in verse four. Whatsoever is right, I will give you. Verse seven, and whatsoever is right, that shall you receive. God is going to reward us properly. And he has, I'm sure, that's why it says the first shall be last and the last shall be first. There, there are things that I might think are, are important criteria that he may not think so. There may be things that he, that he thinks are important that I may not think so. And there are things he sees about our motives for service. There are things he sees about the reason we do the things we do, the manner in which we do the things we do. But you know what? The reward is all about him. Know this. It will be just. It'll be just. And so these guys, some of these guys were kind of bent out of shape. They murmured. There'll be no murmuring in heaven. <laughs> For two reasons. Number one, some of the murmurers won't make it. <laughs> and the other reason, we'll all be changed, right? We'll all be like Christ, so there'll be no murmuring. But some of them were complaining because they said, we, we don't think this is fair. We signed up. We signed up to serve you with the understanding that you're going to give us a day's wages, and we agreed to that. But now these other people came in later in the day, and you paid them just as much as you paid us. You follow that? You can see why they would be disturbed about that? But basically, he said, that's, that's really not your, not your concern. You, you're, I, I, is, are you going to... He, he used this kind of language in verse um, 15. Is it not lawful for me to do... What I will with mine own is thine eye evil because I'm good. You know, God is the one that's going to make these decisions. And so the, here's the bottom line for this. And I hope I never get over this. I'm just amazed God will let me serve him. I, I am amazed that God, the God who made everything out of nothing, spoke all the world into existence, knows the stars by name, that that God would let me serve Him. That's an amazing thing to me. 
And I, don't, I can't say for this for sure, but I, I was thinking about this passage one day, and I was thinking what it might be like at the, at the Bema, at the judgment seat of Christ. Now, I, don't, I can't say that this is going to... I don't even know if we'll all be able to witness other people's rewards. I don't know that for sure. But I was thinking, what would it be like if we were there, and Jesus is handing out the rewards, and He's judging every one of us, not for our sins, but for our works and for our service. That's what the Bible says. To be rewarded. And there's somebody there that maybe got in real late in life. And they didn't have much time. But with all their heart, they serve the Lord. And God abundantly rewarded them for what they did. I can just see, I was seeing myself saying, just cheering, yay, yay for them. Hey, it's all going to be good. I mean, He's going to justly reward us. And it's because it's all because of grace. We're saved because of grace. We serve because of grace. We'll be rewarded because of grace. We don't deserve to be rewarded. And by the way, the purpose of being rewarded is not walking around and having people sign your Bible, you know, because you got, you got a crown. No, the purpose of being rewarded is not for our recognition. The sole purpose of us being rewarded is that we might give Him glory for what we've done. So... We'll all be properly rewarded. Why stand you here idle? You know, today I looked over at that verse. I had, it wasn't in my notes, but I thought about that passage to the, the church at Smyrna over in the book of Revelation chapter 2. He said, Be thou faithful unto death, and I will give thee the crown of life. Be faithful unto death. Isn't that a great goal? To be faithful unto death. Young people, you're, some of you are very, very young. And I know in your eyes, you, I see you as very, very young. And I know you see me. Kind of young. No. But I'm just telling you. You would be a wise person if you would commit yourself to serving the Lord with your life. And you would serve Him for all your life. And make this the only life you've ever lived is serving the Lord. And be faithful unto death. Wouldn't that be a great life? I got good news. He's hiring people tonight. He's, call, he, he's coming back and saying, why are, you, why are you standing here idle? Just get to work. I got a place for you. Get out there and work. And then He comes back and asks again. Why stand you here idle? So tonight... I hope tonight that if there's anyone here tonight that is not presently involved, not, not currently supporting the missions program, not giving to missions, not involved in personal evangelism, you know, not taking gospel tracts around with you and sharing the gospel. If you're not doing that, the landowner is recruiting tonight. I want you to sign on and say, Lord, I'm going to start doing that. I'm going to start getting involved. If you're not giving to missions, you ought to be praying about this. Next Sunday, what, Lord, what do you want me to do? How would you let me be involved? If you're not praying for missionaries, Lord, I want to be more serious about this. I want to hold the ropes. These people, these people are in some parts of the world that are extremely dangerous. Lord, I want to do my part to stand in the gap for them. Would you, would you say tonight, Lord, I'm signing up. Show me where to sign up. Amen? And be faithful unto death. Let's bow our heads together for prayer. I want to have a prayer and then Brother Wartner will come. Thank you again for allowing us to be here. Allow me to be here for this service today. Father, as we pray tonight, I thank you for this passage of Scripture. And I don't know about everybody else, but it challenges me. Lord, thank you for calling us thank you for the six o'clock call and the nine o'clock call and the 12 noon call and the 3 p.m call and the 5 p.m call thank you for thank you for letting us get in on this to serve you with our life and i thank you for people in this room that are all in this is the life they've chosen to live in their occupation around their families in the community, in their church, to 
work in your vineyard. And Lord, would you use this time of missions emphasis to help us more clearly define what you have for us this hour. And we thank you for that. And to our feet with every head bowed and every eye closed as the pianist plays. Maybe tonight you need to heed the call to the recruit to the recruiter as we're the landowner. I don't know a greater thing to do than to serve the Lord. It is the most joyous thing I've ever done. I'm thankful I get to do it full time. But even before that, you know, I wanted to do it. Because when I got saved, I found a purpose to live. And that was all about Him. And I thank God that we as a church can serve Him in the ways that He's given us. I thank you, those of you that are involved, as much as you have been. There's a lot of sacrifice that goes on every single week. You know, people here on Saturdays, giving their time during the week, giving their time putting in long hours, unseen and unheralded, but one day the Lord, the Lord will reward appropriately. I mentioned that decisions made in this month are going to impact eternity one way or another. The decisions we make in our giving and our participation in the Lord's work will be directly responsible in souls being saved or souls being not being able to be get the message before it's too late. May we as people just commit ourselves and say, I want to do something, Lord. Here am I, Lord, send me. You know, I've heard, I've had people tell me this that are getting close to death. They, they regret not serving the Lord. They regret what they could have done but didn't because they got so self-absorbed and they used every excuse that they could find not to serve Him. But one day we're going to pass, all going to pass on, and I thank God if we're saved, we're going to be in heaven. But, but you know what? There, according to the Word of God, there will be great regret from those that have not committed themselves. There will be loss. But we won't lose our salvation it is very clear that the scripture tells us there will be loss, great regret, missed opportunity, and we'll probably see the consequences of that. May we be people who are faithful. There are folks praying. I want to give them a little time yet to do their business with God. But what hinders us from serving? Appreciate the challenge thoughts that if you've gotten off board so to say you can get back on you still got breath you still got time you can do something I think the main thing is may we give him our whole heart give him a whole heart to say Lord I just want to give it all to you the best I can and then each day wake up with that attitude Lord help me to serve you Father, we're thankful tonight for the Word of God. Thank you for the challenge and the encouragement from your Word. We're so grateful, Lord God, that we get to serve you. And Lord, help us to see it as such a privilege, not, not something that's a pain or, a, well, I have to do this, but really a privilege to serve the, great, the greatest king in, in the world the, and be part of the greatest cause in the world, the cause of Christ. Thank you, Lord God, for our good day we've had here today. And may as we round off our missions month next week, may, it, may we have clear guidance on, on our faith promise and, and just this week be faithful and, and trying to reach somebody with the gospel message in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Appreciate the message. Make sure you get by and thank Pastor Smith for coming. And if you're interested in any of his material, I think he's got a few things left out there. And, he's, and he found his square. Yeah, he found his square. So he's good to go and be able to help you out with that. Um, of course, uh, Tuesday we, is our prayer and fasting day, so if you can join us for that, 7 o'clock is the prayer meeting here. And then, of course, Wednesday night we'll be back. Looking forward to be back in the pulpit as we continue our Spirit-filled our spirit -filled living series. Uh, the most significant thing that we need to understand about the Christian life is that we cannot do it in our own power. We need God's power, and that's really what the whole series is about, is finding God's power to live out the Word of God 
appropriately. Yeah. And, uh, and we can't do anything without him. And uh, it's so important that we learn what it means to walk in the spirit and be filled with the spirit. Amen. Yeah. Well, Ian, why don't you come and close with a word of prayer if you could, and then uh, dismiss us. Let's pray. <clears throat> Dear God, thank you for this day. Uh, thank you for uh, the message you've given. Um, please help us to apply it to our lives. Um, help us to not be afraid to uh, step up and serve you with uh, what you have for us. And that, um, like Pastor was talking about, being filled with the Spirit, we have to do it in your Spirit. And uh, help us to um, just... Uh, glorify you with our lives and uh, um, even outside of uh, church um, help us this week to glorify you help us to have a good rest of the week in Jesus name I pray amen thank you you are dismissed mm -hmm.